this is Chala Dinkoy. Welcome to another edition of the Naked Marketing Podcast. I have here today my guest, Christian Espinosa. He is looking very tanned, I might add, and very, very <laughs> rested. <laughs> Which part of the world are you joining us from? I am right outside of St. Louis today. Oh, I've, been really? I've been training outside quite a bit, so maybe that's why I look tanned. That's, I'm not rested though. <laughs> God, I would not, I would not say St. Louis. So I would have said like California. Mm. Very nice. Well, I'm in Toronto, so I, I'm sure that's there. You, there's no glow there. <laughs> we had some sun, but you know, it was limited. Yeah. So it's so nice to have you. Yeah, it's great to be here. So tell us who you help and what you do. So there's, there's two aspects to that. Um, I focus on cybersecurity. So my business, uh, that I started in 2014 and sold in 2020 is focused on cybersecurity. So we help businesses uh, prevent cyber attacks basically. And then I started my personal brand, uh, which is based on a book I wrote, mm -hmm. which helps um, address some of the issues in cybersecurity, which is really around um, the ego and intellectual bullying and um, you know people posturing, trying to be the smartest person in the room. So I've kind of combined those two where I'm trying to fix the underlying issues with cybersecurity, which are like the, the, the people problem really, and uh, provide the services as well through the company that acquired mine. So this is very fascinating. I mean, uh, somebody just copied my email and um, tried to get some money out of a client and pretended mm. that they were me. So how, how does that have to do with intellectual bullying? Uh, well, that's a tactic, but from a defense perspective, you know, why we, these things keep happening is in my industry in cybersecurity, people want to be significant uh, by being smarter than other people. So this inhibits our ability to create effective solutions to prevent cyber attacks because everyone wants to be smarter than somebody else. So if you're positioning yourself as being smarter than someone, then you tend to talk over their head so if you're like a, a technical engineer, you may talk over your leadership's head and they don't really understand the severity of what's going on. And this just kind of like has a ripple effect throughout the entire industry, even within a team itself, people are often afraid to speak up because they might be ridiculed. Somebody might say, well, you should already know that. So there's like all these like things that have really like from an underlying root cause, uh, I believe are reasons we're, we're not doing so well in cybersecurity because we have the technology, we have the frameworks, the thing that's not working is the people. That's fascinating. So people, are, you know, are just refusing the help because of ego. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a believer that you know we all have so two two main human needs we drive towards, and cybersecurity is typically significance and certainty. So people want to be significant by being smarter than other people. That's how they get their significance. And if that's always like the, the program that's running in your brain, uh, it's going to be hard to admit you don't know something. It's going to be hard to communicate in a way that the message is received because then your super special knowledge isn't that special if other people understand it. So there's all these things that manifest in a less than positive way in, in my industry. And I've, and I've experienced this throughout my entire career. And in fact, I was one of the people that used to you know, try to be smarter than other people and speak over their head. I was part of the problem for a while there before I <laughs> created, got, gathered the awareness and was able to do something about it. Well, talk about getting naked. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty honest. Now, yeah. you said that you sold the company just before COVID or right after COVID. Like mm. what happened? Yeah, I sold the company in December of 2020. So kind of in the middle of COVID, I guess. Um, I... In 2019, I had looked to possibly take on uh, an investor because I was growing the company through my own funding. And it's one of these things where, you know, we had to generate more revenue, then we could hire someone, generate more revenue, hire somebody, but the profits had to be enough. And it was like this long slog. And mm -hmm. I felt like the way to grow is either through an acquisition or through a, a you know, a PE firm to invest some money in my company. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just so happened to get like a an email from uh, someone that was interested in buying my company that had heard about me through a mutual acquaintance. So it was a relationship uh, ultimately that that started the discussion and that went on for 
I don't know, like five or six months. And then we finally closed the deal in December. Well, congratulations. Does that mean you're, you know, fancy free foot, whatever that, that saying is, you're like free now? <laughs> well, I think I've always been free. I think we're always free to make our choices. Um, I'm, I'm a managing director for the company that bought mine. Oh. Uh, my brand still exists, uh, Alpine Security. And uh, it's sort of being, you know, integrated into the parent company. And then while I'm doing that, I'm growing my um, other business, which is about um, the egos and dissolving those egos so we can have better communication uh, and more empathy and a lot of things in, in cybersecurity that I think are important. Is that like a coaching business? Yeah, there's some coaching involved with that. There's a course, uh, there's some training, there's speaking, and there's my book as well. Wow, I love that. Could you prescribe a pill for melting my ego? I love it. <laughs> if you could, right? Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah, I would. You just have to remember that your ego is not your amigo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. Excellent tag. Excellent tagline. Okay, so let's talk about marketing. I mean, yeah. you know, the name of the show is Naked Marketing. So tell us your honest marketing mistake, the biggest one that you think caused you to stall the longest. Well, there's been like a lot of marketing mistakes. <laughs> um, the biggest one initially is I, I didn't understand the importance of marketing. So when I started my company, I was kind of like the fill the dreams mindset. Like if I build this stuff, people will come, but nobody came. So, so then I started thinking, why is anybody coming? You know, I, I, when I was an employee for companies, we just had work come in. So I realized that the gap there's marketing and then really niching down the marketing. So for me, initially, one of the problems I made for the small businesses, you want to kind of like attract everybody you feel like, because you don't want to turn anything away because you need the revenue. But ultimately, uh, you know, if you're attracting the wrong clients to your business, they're going to cause more problems than the ideal clients. So that's when I decided I needed to have more, pol more polarity in my marketing and be more polar polarizing and repel the people that I didn't want and attract the people I did want, which is like a kind of a big risk because I thought, well, what if I repel everybody, right? Uh, and that was really a big, big hurdle for me to overcome. And, and as an example, we did cybersecurity training. We still do. We do cybersecurity training and we do these things called boot camps. There's a lot of people that want to take a course uh, to get certified in cybersecurity, but the only reason they want to take the course is to pass the test. And I don't, I don't like those people uh, because they're always problematic. They don't really care about the industry. And I felt like I was contributing to the problems in the industry. So then we sort of changed our marketing. So we said, you know what, if you really care about the industry, you want to pass the test, but you also want to learn the material, this is the place for you. If you just want to pass the test and you want an instructor to teach you the answers to the test, you know, this is not the place for you. And, you know, just things like that really, really helped with the, with our overall experience with, with clients. I love it. I have never heard this term repel marketing. I love it. <laughs> Yeah. I always think I'm attracting who I want and repelling who I don't want. Yes. I really love it because it's like the number one startup mindset is like, I'm going to starve if I just focus on one mm -hmm. slice of the pie. And I always put this P like this picture of a guy at a pie eating contest where he's like trying to eat the whole pie and it, it doesn't feel good or it doesn't taste good and it doesn't look good. And so that's the way it is for when you're trying to eat the whole pie of customers and you're trying to yeah. be everything for everyone. And I just never heard it called repel, repel marketing. Um, I'm definitely gonna use that. <laughs> definitely, this is a quotable, that's excellent. <laughs> um, so how did you, did you, did you figure out this, uh, you know, how to niche down through trial and error or did you actually, you know, do a strategic, some sort of, you know, research and fact finding and insights work to get into which niche is the best for us? Yeah, initially, I think initially we were kind of marketing to everything, you know, but it was like sort of like done haphazardly. There was no focus. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I realized something needed to change. So that's when I decided to niche it down. Like the example I gave you about the class yeah. also, um, 
we just had to focus on a few specific niches in cybersecurity because it's a very broad field. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, one example is like medical device cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like from a marketing perspective, you have to be uh, like viscerally attached to why you want to help people. And with me, with medical devices, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of advances in healthcare. And I would hate to see those advances be um, kind of rolled back because medical devices such as a drug infusion pump, a pacemaker, or any device to the hospital bed is attacked. And I would hate to see someone I love or my grandmother, you know, in the hospital have the device that's saving their life be attacked. So for me, that niche was something I was connected to, uh, mm -hmm. which makes it easier to sell and easier to market if it's something you 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 ha you understand your why and, and, mm -hmm. and your real compelling reasons of the, that's what you want to focus on. Yeah, yeah. I, in fact, it's one of the, it's, we have, a, I've developed a formula because when I used to work for Pepsi, Pizza, Frito-Lay, we launched new products every year and we had to figure out how to sell the new product without cannibalizing the old one. So that's mm. where I learned niching is we had to figure out the gap in the market. So one of the ways that I've created was like, it's a third of the equation is heart, like mm. the, the heart that you had, like the passion that you had. The big problem that I see is that, um, people make it about 100% of the heart and they don't they don't do the research to figure out is there enough money in this niche are people mm. willing to pay me <laughs> what i want and then the other part is do i have reach into that the decision makers in that niche so i'm yeah. so glad it worked out for you but for sure it ha it always starts with is there enough heart um because if there so it's all like a third 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 has to all come together like the perfect storm that's wonderful now you must have had to um, be very, like your opinion is not always a popular one, I'm sure, especially the one in your book, right? Where you talk about egos and, you know, all this difficult stuff, the self-awareness stuff. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you to step out with that kind of visibility and perhaps polarizing opinion? It was uh, extremely kind of scary <laughs> to be honest <laughs> I, I had a lot of um doubts right i, I wrote the book i, uh -huh. I talked about my own story so uh -huh. there's some vulnerable moments about my childhood and that i used to be part of the problem uh and i thought i'm not sure how this is going to be, be received so i had a lot of concerns about that because i've never like not put myself out there so far like publicly where i'm sort of like put a stake in the sand and I'm defending it. Right. So yeah, it was very uh, vulnerable. And, uh, and there for a while I would check Amazon every day to see like what the reviews are going to be like. And I'm like, I'm not going to get a horrible review. The houses can be received, but, uh, so far, uh, almost all the, uh, feedback has been positive. Of course, there's gonna be a few negatives, but, and that's, mm -hmm. uh, to be, you know, that's just going to happen. So I, I came to how, terms with all that. How did you overcome the fear? I felt like in my journey in life that to get to like the next level of a con contribution, uh, like contributing to the industry or to society, that this is a hurdle I must get over, which is myself, my own ego, right? Yeah, I mean, the only thing that's stopping me was my ego getting bruised. And I realized I'm writing a book about the ego, so <laughs> I should have better let this go to publish the book. So, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, you could have like ego seminars and like, you know, I just, I, I love the, the concepts and I love the words that you're using there. Like you, you come from this geeky world and yet you use such clever, um, you know, verbiage around it. So it's all, it's all good. It's, it's like the perfect marriage. So it's great. Now, what advice do you have to business owners who are in the same boat and, you know, they want to make a difference and they want to grow their company. Uh, one thing that's really helped me uh, along with the, the repelling and attracting marketing is realizing that you should be viewing your prospect as like a hero in, in, in the journey and you're the guide. I know, I know a lot of companies when they're marketing, they like to position themselves as the expert and, you know, the hero of the story, but really uh, the the prospect should be the hero because you want to make your prospect or your, you know, ultimately turn into your client. You want to make them feel understood 
and appreciated. If they don't feel those two things, they're probably not going to end up, you know, coming to your organization to even talk to your talk to you about your services. So I think it's important when you're talking to someone or marketing to them that you make sure they feel understood and appreciated. Um, yeah, because ultimately people buy based on emotions and then justify it later with logical reasons. So That's you need to exactly. you need to be um, marketing towards those emotions and, and from from like you said from the heart. It shouldn't be uh, you know, this thing that you don't really believe in yourself because people. Yeah, absolutely. So where could people reach you, Christian? They can reach me on my website, uh, christianespinoza.com or on LinkedIn. And my book is also on Amazon, the smartest person in the room. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed our discussion.